Welcome to our lecture online. If we think about what life requires for life to exist in this universe, well, we can come up with quite a list. Now, here's a list on the board. It's not an exclusive list. It's not a complete list. It's just some thoughts that I put together thinking, well, what would you need for life to have a chance of surviving and thriving? So let's take a look at this list and see, and of course we keep that in mind when we start looking throughout our galaxy and throughout the universe, and we're looking for potentially habitable planets, what are some of the things that we would like for those planets so that life has a chance of starting up, and we don't know yet how, but starting up and surviving and thriving and growing and adapting, and maybe turning into intelligent life over time. So first of all, water is probably at the top of the list. Water is that solvent, the perfect solvent in the universe that allows chemical reactions to occur better than any other solvent we can think of. It is hard to imagine that life can exist without the presence of liquid water. Then carbon. Carbon is the best molecule on the periodic table that provides a backbone, basically a spinal column for life to exist with. In other words, carbon can make four bonds it can connect to four other molecules and continue to do so and thus involving into a tremendous number of different chains, organic molecules that are necessary for life. Yes, silicon kind of can do the same thing, but there's some big drawbacks on silicon that make it a far secondary choice to the backbone of life. Carbon by far is the one molecule that allows life to exist or the one not molecule, but the one atom that allows life to exist. Next, we probably want to look for a terrestrial planet or even a terrestrial moon. In other words, something we can walk on with a hard surface. It's hard to imagine that life can exist inside the atmosphere of Jupiter, for example, because the turbulence and the change in the temperature and the life forms coming up and being exposed to space and going far back down as the turbulence of the atmosphere moves everything around. It's hard to imagine that life can exist in such an environment. So we probably are looking for a terrestrial planet or a terrestrial moon. We're looking for a planet or a moon near a stable star, a star that will be around for a long time and basically won't, won't change for billions of years. Our sun is one of those stars. Our sun will stay on the main sequence for about 10 billion years. And for most of those 10 billion years, it'll make an environment where the earth and the life on it can thrive. We want a long-lasting star. Just as I mentioned, we don't want something like an O or a B type star where it only be on the main sequence for a very short period of time, 10, 50, 100 million years, before it turns into a red giant. Life probably will not survive on a planet nearby a star like that. Then we want a planet located in the Goldilocks zone. In other words, we don't want it to be too hot and we don't want it to be too cold. We already know that, that um, Mercury and Venus are in locations where it's just too hot for life to exist. And then as you go further out in the solar system, when you get out to Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, it's very unlikely that life will exist on those planets and their moons. It's just too cold way out there. Then we want a planet that has an atmosphere for two reasons, actually three reasons. You want heat retention. If you go to the moon, which is roughly the same location, relative to the sun as the earth, in the daytime it becomes extremely hot, in the nighttime it becomes extremely cold. The switch in the temperature between day and night on the moon is enormous, hundreds of degrees compared to the change in the temperature on any given location on the earth. Also, you want protection from the dangerous rays from space. UV, X-ray and gamma ray, which would obliterate life on the earth, well, it doesn't make it to the surface because the protection of the nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere. And of course, you want an atmosphere to retain enough pressure for liquid water to exist. And that's also very important because, for example, on the moon, you couldn't have liquid water. Even on Mars, there's not enough atmosphere to create the pressure to have liquid water on the surface. You probably want oxygen. Oxygen is necessary for the, for the combustion reactions, which is a basis for life in, in animals, for example. Without oxygen being present, it's unlikely to imagine that life could exist. You also don't want, don't want too much oxygen or too little oxygen. Again, life depends upon a certain range of the oxygen being present in the atmosphere. You probably want a planet with a magnetic field. 
you want a magnetic field to protect you from the solar wind of the star. In this case, the sun has a solar wind, but every star potentially has a solar wind. And those solar wind particles, they would slam into the surface of the planet, would be absolutely deadly to life. So we need a magnetic field to protect us from that. The Earth, of course, has that magnetic field. We want an ozone layer because not all UV radiation is stopped by the atmosphere. UVB would make it through and UVB would be a deadly onslaught of radiation unless we would be protected from it. And yes, our ozone layer protects us from that. You want a large enough planet, a large enough planet with enough gravitational force that can hang onto its atmosphere. Mercury was not successful in hanging onto its atmosphere and neither was Mars. Mars has lost almost all of its atmosphere that's our kitty cat. Something. Anyway, continuing on. So Mars has lost almost all of its atmosphere, and you can see that because of that, you can't have liquid water on the surface and probably not a good location for life. You want enough surface water. So even though water is necessary, you probably want enough of it. Imagine if the Earth only had a quarter of the surface covered with water, or only 10% of the surface covered with water, and let's say the other 90% was land mass, then the difference in winter and summer, daytime and nighttime, would be absolutely enormous. You would have a very hard time having life on a planet that has such enormous amount of land mass and almost no water. You'd have virtually no rain, no hydrological cycle, and probably not a good place for life. So again, large quantities of water, large oceans are probably what you need for the climate and for the stability and for the rain and the hydrological cycle to exist. So what else do we have? Over here, let's go to number 13. We have correct rotation for day and night duration. Can you imagine living on Venus? Now let's say that Venus has a planet with the right atmosphere and all the right conditions, but the same rotational speed and of course retrograde rotation. Because of that, the years I mean, the days and night last for years on Venus. And so you would have continuous sun for an enormous amount of time and then nighttime for a very long amount of time. And that would probably be not a good place for life to try and exist. We want a solar system with just a single star for the orbit of the planet to be relatively stable, about the same distance from the sun for most of its orbit and during the duration. You'd probably want just a single star rather than two stars or three stars in the solar system. And, of course, you want the correct amount of greenhouse gases in your atmosphere. Venus is probably not a good place to live because the heat retention of the atmosphere is absolutely enormous. And, of course, Mars, there's not enough atmosphere. And on the Earth, if there weren't any greenhouse gases, it would be bitter cold and life would have a very tough time existing on the Earth. So, again, the proper, number of, the proper amount of atmosphere and greenhouse gases. So this, I think I've mentioned that already before, so that's kind of a duplicate. You want the correct amount of atmosphere for liquid water to exist. You want enough atmospheric pressure. And you don't want to live in a binary star system, not only because of the orbit would not be stable, but you want a binary star system, no bar binary star system. So the binary partner, if it was a larger star, would eventually turn into a red giant and it may obliterate all life on the planet and not leave enough time for life to be able to evolve. So, those are some of the conditions, again, not complete, and I thought of one more perhaps. You want a planet with a nearly circular orbit, because if it was a very elliptical orbit, again, you would have enormous differences between seasonal temperatures that you don't want to expose life to. So that might be potentially point number 18. So you can see there's a, no a lot of things that we want to think about as far as the amount of conditions required for life. Now, could life exist if some of these conditions weren't there? Potentially, but it would be harder and harder. The less of these conditions were present in a particular planet, the less likely it would be for life to be able to at least begin, survive, and thrive on that planet. So, I would say, if I, were to, if I was asked, what do you think a planet needs for life? There it is. There's my list. So what about a complete water planet? Yes, I guess that would still, like, you know, like in that movie, The Water World, where the whole planet was covered with water. <laughs> don't, don't drag me into your movies. <laughs> yes, I believe that if you had a planet that was completely covered in water and not completely covered in ice, you'd have a place where life could exist. Yeah. It would be, of obviously, uh, marine life, and yes, no problem there. Didn't you say one of the moons that's covered in complete ice, they thought 
so Europa is the moon, one of the moons of Jupiter. I thought it was Io. No, one of them. Is it Europa? Europa. So Europa is, com is presumably completely covered in ice, and beneath the ice, presumably completely covered in an ocean. So we think that all of Europa is covered in an ocean with a thick layer of ice on it. Because of that thick layer of ice, there's less likely for life to be able to exist. Um, that's more science fiction than fiction. To get the equipment on the surface of Europa with the energy to be able to get through the ice, it, it would be virtually impossible. To do that adventure, if you try to do that on the Earth, let's say you go to the Arctic and you try to drill a hole there, the equipment you would need to do that, and it's on the Earth with all the atmosphere and everything that you would possibly want there, I think it would be very difficult to reproduce that on Europa, and that ice could easily be many miles thick, and there's no way you're going to drill through that ice. I'd say it'd be very, very difficult, but there may be potential uh, options such as are there cracks in the ice that you can throw a, a machine down that can then go into the water and that kind of stuff. But again, it is so cold in Europa, so incredibly cold. The temperature in Europa is probably around 120, 125 degrees Kelvin. It is so incredibly cold that there's probably no way you can get to any sort of liquid water on the surface.